All right, Luke, chapter 1 is where we find ourselves this morning. Starting a brand new series. I will, the next two Sundays, um, I, I'm not preaching. Now, I will be here. I'll, I'll be here. Uh, but the next two Sundays, and, and part of that was, I, I thought we were going to be moving into the new building, to be honest, in December. And... Uh, and so I was thinking I'm going to need time to spend extra time on the building, and that's that's not happening. And uh, so anyways, next week Chris is preaching. The following week after that, Marcus will be preaching for us. And so, uh, so I'm just looking forward to sitting under the Word of God myself and hearing the preaching myself. All right, Luke chapter 1 is where we find ourselves this morning. Brand new series. I want to ask you this question. What do you think of this? This is the picture I wanted to show you. What do you, uh, some, of our, some of our engineers in here are thinking about all the ways that that could have been avoided, right? And engineers spoken to one another, right? If men built this, women are thinking what? They should have followed directions, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I will say this. Yes, the photo was manipulated. So if you try to do is check out Snopes, you, you, it, it's manipulated, all right? Don't worry about it. Um, but it serves a greater point. The point is this, is that bridges are essential. Bridges are essential to arrive at an intended destination. Books of the Bible serve as bridges as well. They function like bridges. That is, there is one overarching storyline of the Bible, and individual books support this larger storyline. And Luke 1, specifically, serves as a bridge for skeptics, for doubters, uh, for people who have questions. And, and actually, Luke actually invites doubters and skeptics to investigate the claims of Jesus. And so if this is you, if you are a kind of, if you're on a, a faith journey yourself, then I say to you this, then Luke's gospel is for you. And if you have friends who are skeptical about Christianity, I would encourage you over while we're walking through the book of Luke to invite them because this is the intent and purpose of Luke's gospel. So this morning I want to preach to you a message titled, The Bridge to Jesus. The Bridge to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we have saying glorious truths this morning. We consider about moving into a new building and adding a part-time assistant pastor. There's so many things, so many moving pieces to all of this. And we, Lord, we want to do your will. We want to be wise and follow your leading and your guiding. So, Lord, do that for the next few months. Guide us and direct us. We set aside this time because most of all we want to hear from you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Before I, show, before I introduce to you these bridges from Luke 1, I want to introduce you to the author of, the, of this gospel. Luke, uh, Luke can be described in, in many ways. Uh, he is, he's not one of the original 12 disciples, so he's not one of the original 12. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile convert to Christianity. In fact, I want to do this, you're in Luke 1, turn to Acts chapter 11, and let me show this to you, Acts chapter 11, and show you where Luke comes onto the scene, and Acts chapter 11, verse 19, reads this way, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, and Cyprus, and Antioch, so that because of the persecution, they're all over these cities, speaking the word to no one except Jews, but there were some of them men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. Who are the Hellenists? These are the non-Jews who are believers in Jesus, right? Men from Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists uh, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, who believed turned to the Lord. Now drop down to Acts chapter 13. 
Now, there were, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Well, who were they? Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. What you have here is this church history is nearly unanimous in agreement that Lucius of Cyrene that you see there in verse 1 is the Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He's from a city called Cyrene. He's part of Paul's, he becomes part of Paul's traveling entourage. We know him as Luke. He's from Cyrene. Let me show you a map. Uh, here's Cyrene. This is North Africa. So Lucius of Cyrene is from here. Antioch, oh goodness, it's, it's way above Myra. It's not even on the map here, but it's, it's straight north here. So Lucius of Cyrene, a North African man, is traveling perhaps on business. He's a physician. I don't know if there is a medical convention going on in Antioch. I don't know why he was there. But it is there that Lucius of Cyrene hears the gospel that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, hears from one of the Hellenists there. And from there, Luke, beco Lucius becomes Luke, and Luke becomes a traveling partner of the Apostle Paul. And it is as Paul's traveling companion that we, he begins to pen the history of Jesus. Maybe his business brought him to Antioch in Colossians Paul refers to him as the beloved physician. He's a doctor. But he's not just a doctor. Luke is a leader in the church at Antioch. In fact, did you know this? That Luke writes one quarter of your New Testament. Luke writes 25% of your New Testament is written by Dr. Luke. That's right. He writes a prequel. That's the gospel of Luke that we're in. But his sequel is which book? The book of Acts. The uh, book of Acts is 28 chapters. Luke has 24 chapters. You count, do the math, 52 chapters. That's exactly 25% of the chapters written in the New Testament are by Dr. Luke. He is a physician. He's a leader at the church in Antioch. And he's also a historian. Uh, you're in Acts, I think, right? Turn, turn to chapter 1, and we're almost, we're almost, we'll stay put. Turn to Acts chapter 1, and then look at verse 1. This is the sequel of the book of Acts. He says this, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that began, all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. So whoever wrote this book writes it to Theophilus. Now, turn back, and we'll be there for the remainder of the time, turn back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. So, Luke writes a two-volume history to his friend Theophilus of how the church began. Luke is a, a detailed historian. One secular, a secular historian, Sir William Ramsey, wrote this. He actually set out to disprove the validity of Luke and Acts. Ramsey would later be quoted as saying this, quote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, this author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. So Luke is a leader, he's a physician, he's an author, historian. Make no mistake, all of these descriptions pale in comparison to the one description that Luke, that Luke receives and owns for himself. He is an evangelist. He is Billy Graham 1.0. Luke is primarily concerned to present the Christian gospel. That Jesus rescues sinful people. Now, because Luke is an outsider to Judaism. Right? He's not a Jew. And most of Christianity is made up of who? Former Jews, right? Christianity early on is not seen as its own separate religion. We think of today as kind of the three great world religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. That's not how Christianity was originally thought of. Christianity was thought as kind of a sect, an, an offshoot, uh, uh, a kind of an unorthodox offshoot of Judaism, at least by the Jews themselves. 
And as a non-Jew, Luke is concerned about those who are on the outside. Luke's gospel is for the social outcast. He is for the marginalized, the disadvantaged, the poor, the sick, the harassed, the demon-possessed. Well, he's for the widows and the bereaved parents. He's for children. He's for the social underworld of tax collectors and sinners. He is even for Gentiles and Samaritans, half-Jews. This, this is a gospel for the outcast, for the social outcast. Luke's gospel is a gospel for women. Luke holds up a childless mom in Luke 1. He holds up a young woman in her unplanned pregnancy in chapter 2. He writes of Anna the prophetess. He speaks of a widow whose son Jesus resurrects. He writes delicately of a woman, who, who, a repentant woman who anoints Jesus' feet with her own hair. Luke records that there was a band of women who traveled with Jesus in his ministry, who ministered to them, and of their own resources provided for Jesus in his ministry. Luke will write of a crippled woman whom Jesus heals. And all of these accounts are only in Luke's gospel. In a culture that degraded women, the gospel of Jesus and Luke's history holds women up. This is not just a gospel for those who are outcasts and not just a gospel for women. It is a gospel for sinners. Because Luke tells story after story after story that while Judaism is for the well-to-do, the moral, the upright, simply put this, Judaism was for the winners of their day. But folks, the world of winners, they do not offer free forgiveness. Why? They don't offer free forgiveness because that would bring religious riffraff into their community. And this is a pure community. We don't want that religious riffraff. Luke will teach us that Jesus' gospel is for losers. And the only ones, but folks, who wants to stand in the loser line? I'll tell you who does. Only the ones who want to stand in that line are only the ones who have blown it. The ones who have messed up. The ones who are, re, are, who are forsaken and rejected by the moral, well-to-do gooders of the world. You see, religiosity and moralism sells well, but free grace and mercy isn't very appealing to the self-righteous. And so Luke will confront our assumptions about who is fit for the gospel. Luke will challenge middle-class Americana Christianity. For Jesus' gospel is not for the up-and-coming, but it is for those who are down and out. So our message this morning is titled, The Bridge to Jesus. And this morning in Luke 1, I see three bridges in this text that lead us to Jesus. Here's bridge number one, and it is this, the Gospel of Luke delivers confidence to God's people who waver. But let me put it simply, Luke delivers a bridge from uncertainty certainty. He delivers a bridge from skepticism to confidence. And he records this for a friend who seemed to struggle with doubt. His name is Theophilus, and Theophilus is hesitant to believe. He's, he's reticent to believe. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished or fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some uh, time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Why? That you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. 
many Bible scholars think that because Luke uses the description most excellent, that Theophilus was a man of rank, maybe a man of wealth, a man of stature for sure. But we're not exactly sure why Theophilus is doubtful of Christian teaching. But what we are confident is this, is that Luke is confident that what he records will help his friend have certainty in Christian teaching. And so Luke says, Theophilus, this Jesus and his teachings, you can rely on them. So if you have doubts, if you're skeptical, then I invite you with your skeptical eye and your doubting heart to examine the gospel of Luke and to consider the claims of Jesus. And you see, bridge one leads us from doubt and disbelief to trust and faith. Here's bridge two. The, here's bridge two. The gospel of Luke documents God's preparation for salvation. The Gospel of Luke is going to document God's preparation for salvation, or simply put, Luke provides a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He provides a bridge. How are we going to span from Old Testament to New Testament? And the word preparation is an important word. So you see, from the final page of your Old Testament, the final page of, of our Old Testament is the book of Malachi. And when you take, for me, it's one page. When you take the book of Malachi, that one page that stands between Malachi and Matthew, that one page there, when I flip that page and go to the Gospel of Matthew, do you know how many years I just turned? I turned 400 years with one turn of the page. You see, in that intervening years, those 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, were what they call silent years. No visions. No miracles. There's no prophets. God is not speaking to His people who have been so disobedient for so long. And so in order to give context to the teachings of Jesus, Luke introduces Theophilus to someone that we would not introduce Theophilus to, right? We would want to get into the good stuff. Like, show, show Theophilus how Jesus turns water into wine. That's cool. Show him how he, he takes bread and he can multiply bread. I know. Tell Theophilus about that story about how Jesus heals lepers. Do that. But Luke the historian is careful to lay down a framework he just doesn't want to wow you with the big stuff that Jesus can do. He wants to show you that there's a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That this is not some kind of offshoot sect. That this really, this thing called Christianity is what God has been intending the entire time. And so he introduces Theophilus to a very nondescript old man and old woman. Now they are humble and they are righteous. They are childless. This is how Luke describes Zechariah the priest and Elizabeth, who is a priest's daughter. They are part of the faithful remnant who are waiting for God to send his rescuer. And Zechariah's name is important because his name means this. It means Yahweh has remembered again. Well, for 400 years, the nation of Israel has been waiting, and God still hasn't remembered them. But whoever Zechariah's parents are, they named him Zechariah because they too were filled with confidence and hope that God would remember. And this signals for us something as we read the text, that God is intending to do something. Not just for this childless couple, but also for his people. Now this is the apex of Zechariah's career. And I say it's the apex of Zechariah's career because there are 18,000 priests in the nation of Israel. Verse 39 of Luke chapter 1 teaches us that uh, Zechariah was not a priest in Jerusalem, that Mary actually has to go visit her cousin Elizabeth, right? And when she does, she has to go out into the country. So Zechariah is a priest out in the country. He's, in, he's, in, he's out in the sticks is what we would say. He is chosen to offer prayer inside the temple. I want to show you a picture of what 
Zechariah would have seen. It was a picture of the temple and he would have washed his hands here at the labor. People would be uh, standing outside here while the prayers are going on. Probably the, incense, the prayers of incense was probably in evening time. People probably would have not just filled this inner court, but they would have been filling even around outside. Zechariah would have walked in. You see, here is the altar of incense. Uh, here's the menorah, the, the lampstand. And it's as he is standing here. Well, let me give you one more picture. It may help you out a little bit. It's as he is standing here. This is the Holy of Holies, where God's presence resides. The Ark of the Covenant is on the inside. He's offering prayers of incense, and he's doing it on behalf of God's people who are outside also praying. And it is where we find this. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 8. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. There are two miracles here. Zechariah is not praying, I would argue this way, that Zechariah is not praying for he and Elizabeth to have a child. As any faithful, God-fearing priest would be doing at this time, with 400 years of silence, he would be praying that God would send salvation, deliverance to his people. They were looking for Messiah. He is praying for Israel's salvation. And he has a holy heart attack as he's in there. Kind of a, a holy cardiac arrest, if you will. Because an angel appears. To the right of the altar of incense, or looking at it the way he is, to the left, in between the lampstand. So what's the real miracle? Is it an angel that's coming? Is that the real miracle? Or that his wife is going to have a baby? Is that the miracle? Neither. The real miracle is this is that the baby that has been promised to he and to Elizabeth is a fulfillment of specific Old Testament prophecy. 500 years earlier, and it is intended to remind the reader of specific Old Testament passages showing this, the unity and reliability of the Scriptures. Theophilus, you're doubting. Let me show you something here. Don't be, don't be blown away by the smoke and the mirrors of this massive angel and this promise to this old couple. Oh, rather, be blown away that God has fulfilled His promise from 500 years earlier given through the prophet Malachi. Be blown away with that, reader. This is what we're to be blown away with. And you are alerted. Because the angel says to Zechariah, you're supposed to name him John. Why? Because John means the Lord is gracious. Right? Now, as a parent, we had a baby dedication last week. Right? We, like, we think all babies are cute, but our baby is the cutest, right? And your baby did something on day 17, well, my baby did that on day 14. Right? That's how we as parents are. But I want you to hear how this angel talks about how John, or how Zechariah and Elizabeth's baby, what he's going to be like. Now this is something. Look at verse 14. It reads this way. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great. That, the word is mega, megas. He will be mega before the Lord. He'll be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. That's interesting. 
from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him, that is God. He'll go before God in the spirit and power of Elijah. So he's going to have a, he's going to have a powerful ministry in Zechariah. What is this powerful ministry going to look like? Well, it's going to look this way, verse 17. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. His ministry is going to be mega. It's going to be massive. What Luke is doing is this. For the Old Testament reader, Luke is beginning, he's pulling this phrase from the Old Testament, slamming it down. He's pulling this phrase from the prophet Isaiah. Let's put it there. He's pulling this one from Malachi. Let's put this one here. And he's trying to weave a web for you to show you that this bridge from Old Testament to New Testament is eventually going to lead us to Jesus, Theophilus. For instance, he is quoting from Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. You may want to write these references down. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. No, that is, do you see that word destruction? That is the very last word in your Old Testament. That's Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. And so the very last word that the Old Testament reader would have read would have been destruction. And if I'm recalling my King James English pretty well right now, in the King James Version it says something like this. Malachi 4, verse 6, it ends with the word curse. Now why does it end with the word curse or destruction is equally fine. Because for the next 400 years, there will be a curse on God's people. He will not speak. There will be utter destruction. And so when the fact that an angel comes and stands in between the altar of incense and the menorah, this is big news because nothing has happened for 400 years. And on top of that, whoever this baby that is coming, there's something different about this baby. reading from Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 which is another one he picked up and placed here for us Luke or Malachi writes behold I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me friends seeing this prophecy fulfilled in the birth of John not only anticipates another impossible pregnancy and birth but it also invites you to examine the truthfulness and accuracy of the Bible for John's birth is prophesied 400 years by Malachi and 700 years by the prophet Isaiah. Only a supernatural book guided by God could have been written in this way. So Luke is teaching us to rely on Jesus' teaching and is inviting us to reason with him on the Bible's trustworthiness and accuracy. And the final bridge is this. The Gospel of Luke demands a response God's promises. Or simply put, Luke's third bridge demands a response to God's revelation. Two responses are recorded here, one by Zechariah and one by his wife, Elizabeth. Zechariah responds with doubt, and his wife, Elizabeth, responds with joyful faith. Let me show this to you in verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife has advanced in years. And the angel said, answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you the good news. Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. People were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay. Even they realized something was going on. And when he came out, he was unable to speak. And they realized that he had seen a vision. How? I don't know. And he kept making signs to them. And he remained mute. And when his time of service ended, he went home. <coughs> After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on to me to take away my reproach among people. See, it doesn't take long for a priest to offer up a prayer, which is why the Jews are questioning the delay. And when Zechariah appears, it says he appears speechless. Now, verse 62 of chapter 1 appears that he was also deaf. 
And the reason why I say that is because he is giving them some type of sign language that he's learned on the spot. And they are signing back to him in verse 62. Now thankfully his handicap and his unbelief are both temporary. Because the next time we hear Zechariah, the next time we see Zechariah, do you know what he's going to be doing? He's going to be singing. Right after Mary's Magnificat, Zechariah will have his own benediction. And he too will sing. And so here's the truth. God's revelation precedes man's response. That is, every time God reveals himself, there is a response from man. It may be unbelief, or it may be faith, but there is a response. And the Gospel of Luke will demand a response of some kind to God himself, to Christ. <coughs> and these three bridges, friend, they lead us to rely, to reason, and then to respond. And so I want to conclude this way with three applications. Number one. Unbelief, thankfully I say this, unbelief is not final. For you personally or for your friends. If you are naturally a skeptical person, one reason Luke writes this gospel is so that you might have certainty about Jesus' teachings and therefore your beliefs based upon Jesus' teachings. So number one, unbelief is not final. Number two, unbelief is no excuse for the claims of Jesus. The Bible is provided to dispel unbelief. Like a massive spotlight shining upon the dark, shadowy doubts of your heart. The Bible takes its language and, peer, and, and just casts that light right into those doubts. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John 5 that these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And so Luke, the historian, gives careful attention to detail to assure you of the accuracy of Jesus' works and teachings. And finally, I say this to you, that unbelievers are welcome to ask questions. I want to say this to you, that Jesus is God enough to handle your questions. The bridges that God provides can bear the weight of your doubts, your skepticism, your curiosity, your questions, your shame, and your estrangement from God. So Jesus says, bring them on. I can handle your questions. The question is, will you be able to handle Jesus' answers? That's the real question. And the Gospel of Luke will confront us Sunday after Sunday after Sunday with the certainty and the assurance that this Son of Man is Jesus, the Son of God. So I conclude this way, Grace Life. Trust God's preparation. Trust God's plan. Trust God's provision for salvation. For it is divinely prepared, biblically fulfilled, carefully recorded and winsomely taught in that copy of the scriptures you hold in your hand.